Hey, Dan, uh, before we jump into the, the meat of the night, why don't you uh, introduce yourself so that everyone kind of knows who you are. I'm Dan Nelson. I am the owner and clinical director of Crossroads Counseling Centers. Uh, it's located, if you go through the Dumb Brothers drive through for coffee, you're looking right at my building. I'm right there at the white building with the red roof. We have uh, nine therapists there, I think, and doing a lot of online stuff, and now we're starting to come back in office, but there's a Christian basis to everything we do, but we're all, we all got a unique relationship with the Lord, different gifts sets that uh, therapists have, so, um, but uh, I can't say we can um, address every, every situation, but uh, we try to make sure to be team players in the community so that if there is uh, something that we can't really honestly address directly in the best, in the best manner, we make sure there's referrals to people that we need to set up with. But uh, yeah, we've been doing this since 98. Uh, Crossroads. How many of you, you know exactly where we're going? <laughs> who was born in 98? Or like, who was, who was alive? In 1998, you got most of the crowd. So you're good. You're good. Uh, that's awesome. And you have four kids, yep. and they're all my age, a little younger. So this is like talking to your kids, huh? Somewhat. It's like what? You say? It's like talking to your kids. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's unique. But my kids make a lot more fun of me than I think these guys will. So yeah. it's true. We'll, we'll present you as a I've professional. Got no, I've got no standard or whatever with the kids. That's awesome. Um, so we had a couple questions for tonight, introducing yourself. And then um, just so that everyone's on the same page, can you help us define um, mental health? Because I think that culture has a very significant definition of mental health, whereas on the clinical side, um, it may be totally different. I think that most of us, when we think of about mental health, we think through how we're feeling that day, um, how we um, can get rid of things in our lives to feel better. It's all about me. It's all about feeling better. It's all about who I am. Uh, so normally I just talk off the cuff, but honestly tonight I wanted to make sure out of deep respect for Pastor Manny that I actually got this organized. Um, here so I didn't keep going down rabbit trails, which is what I can do. By the way, there's a guy in the audience, Adam Westby. I think he'd make a great speaker for you guys too, so get him set up on something, because he's amazing, actually. If you ever get him going and uh, stuff, I don't know if you got him going, he's got this great sense of humor, and he knows a lot. So, and he worked with me for a while, so yeah, get, get him to speak on something. Done. All right. I think he just wants me to come back and work for him. I love it. <laughs> All right. So mental health, in a way that I've seen it, that I've used, is there's kind of four spheres in our life. you got the marital family, the vocational, the social, and the personal. Marital family, uh, vocational, social, and personal. Um, Marital family, that's obviously what it is there, but even if you're not married yourself or have kids, it's your extended family. How well are you connected to a, a, a family group? Vocational, or it can be that you might be studying at school, but are you on some path there where it feels like you're being fulfilled in that area? Uh, socially, do you have friends in your life? You can be an introvert and versus extrovert, but you still need some solid people. and. Uh, Basically, rule of thumb even for kids going through school, uh, grade school into high school, is if they've got two solid friends, they're going to make it. Um, it's just that whole sense of you know, they can be an introvert, but if they've got two solid friends, they're going to be okay. Uh, personal is your hobbies, um, and your marital can cross over to that area, hopefully, because two do become one. Uh, hopefully, there's that sense of personal satisfaction there. But also there's a separateness from that where you got to be able to step away from the marital relationship, um, not in a bad way, but be able to maintain friendships or maintain uh, your own personal time in that. And kind of the rule of thumb is when you're failing in two of those areas or you're letting one of the areas take over too much to the sacrifice of them, when two of those areas are failing, you're going to probably have some problems. Um, 
different way to think about it, but it actually fits. Um, some other ways, though, to think about mental health, you got the diagnostic mental health medical model, uh, which sees everything as a problem uh, there. And so uh, when you go in, oftentimes, to a professional, they're looking at you as a diagnosis. I give diagnosis, diagnoses, but I always try to see the person as a healthy person before I even know what that healthy person looks like. So to me, it's an adventure, and I'll tell them whether it's a marriage or an individual, they may come in in a tougher spot and get to know the issues, but also to let them know that um, a big part of this is I don't know you healthy, I and mean, that's what I'm going for. So a part of that is, uh, um, just mixing things up here, uh oh, I'm going down one of those trails. It's okay, people like rabbit trails here. <laughs> they really do. I'll jump in here at this point is societally, People only seem to seek counseling um, not to get better, but to hurt less. Uh, so um, this is where I pl shamelessly plug my book. Um, about half of what I already set up here is in this book, uh, and it's available out there. I wrote it a couple years ago, The Missional Counselor. But it just really gives things in there that I've learned as a therapist over time. Uh, and such and so one of the pages there I put a scale in there that just from negative 100 to positive 100 and zeros in the middle and just that sense that most people when they're coming in the office keep targeting zero if they're in the negative you know 100 up to the zero somewhere in there and they're just targeting zero and then they'll cook counseling after a while and, and basically what I'm trying to do is help them define and understand their plus 100 which obviously you can't do if uh, Christ isn't part of the process, but uh, we'll talk about that later. But, um, so it's that aspect of helping them define their plus 100, so to speak. Um, and the other thing is helping, um, realizing <laughs> that we all have pockets of psychopathology. So <laughs> explain. <laughs> Uh, when you do the diagnostic model, sometimes people can get so overly focused on the bad stuff. So they told us when we were going through psychopathology class, which is the real deep, uh, problematic psychological problems, you know. Um, <laughs> the professor said, uh, just so you know, everybody, you're going to see yourself on one of these pages. Don't freak out. <laughs> but these are the what, what the, the diagnoses are is when the person has gotten stuck in one of these areas and can't get out of it. He said most people are healthy enough where they'll float into different areas. And so you guys will all know that some of you will be um, OCD, you know, um, some of you will have depressive tendencies, some of you will be anxious. But for the most part, you've created coping uh, styles, and the Lord has helped you through specific parts of that. But we all have areas that we will uh, be bent to because of our being born in a sin nature, a fallen nature. We'll have areas that we will lean into that are negative on that. We'll cover that a little bit more later on the negative mindset. But yeah. the other thing is just I want to make sure is to realize that the brain, with the mental health realm, what gets overlooked sometimes in the spiritual realm, is the brain is a physical organ in your body. And so... A lot of times people just see mental health issues as a, uh, a thought issue, a, a, a belief issue, or um, just a will issue. And those things are important in the process, but sometimes you have to pull back and say, you really do med need some medication because something's wrong in your body. Uh, your brain is signaling something not to produce the right amount of chemistry. And then back, coming back in, the brain can't read things right, so it gets stuck in a, a loop um, negatively. And so um, I'm not against meds. I'm not pro-meds, not anti-meds. It's just more, I always have used that as a rule of thumb, but the brain is an organ. It's a physical organ. So that's uh, some definitions of it. No, that's fascinating. Um, and you kind of touched a little bit where people will come to therapy or seek counseling because they want to get to zero. Or you said they want to hurt less, which I think is so interesting is they want to hurt less. Um, but not necessarily get better. Right, exactly. But so I was thinking through, and we, we talked about this a little bit, is the differences, um, what are some of the differences or trends that you see when it comes to mental health or mental health awareness uh, in regards to, like, say, I think my dad, he would never see 
counsel a counselor ever in his life, but um, that I have seen how that affects me to where even me personally, I am somewhat shut off to that idea or closed off to that idea, whereas um, other people my age are more willing to go seek counseling. So how have you seen uh, from different generations the uh, trend of mental health going? Because I think, you know, I think that um, the we see more and more cases of depression or anxiety or things like that. Is it because of the world or is it because people are actually seeking help? My brain went in five different directions. Let's hear it. I don't have time. <laughs> but it's... As long as it's focused. Well, when you're talking about, obviously my dad was the same way. So that's part of in the book too, a little bit. My struggle to embrace this as a um, realm because I felt like I was violating something in my family by seeking out being a therapist. Uh, on that, and it was a distinct call. So the Lord whacked me with a two by four between the eyes of saying, "This is what you'll do." And if I didn't have, if I had not had that calling on my driveway out in North Dakota, uh, I wouldn't have done it. And so, uh, even right after I had a, a God experience with my son walking on the driveway, and <clears throat> and I was planning on going to North Dakota State, the farm had uh, failed financially. And so I was planning on taking ag engineering there. I thought, well, if I can't drive the machinery, I'm going to build it, design it. Um, and so about a month before, I was going to head to NDSU in the fall of 1985, Ox, to maybe I'm on this walk on a driveway. And uh, just, I suppose, it's a half mile long driveway. So I turned around, and I'm about two thirds of the way home. And it was literally like an electric shock experience where this was, uh, you will go to NDSU, but you can change your major to psychology. You will go to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and you will take, get your major in counseling psychology, and you will go to Minnesota and practice. So it was like, okay. And so I had that moment, and I had some exposure to psychology classes at a Bible college at Bemidji and Oak Hills, I've gone there. But <laughs> so I came to tell my mom this when we got. I got back to the house and I said, um, Clint, you and I were talking about this, we're both Baptists. So uh, I came up to my, <laughs> my mom and I, I said, uh, this just happened on the driveway and she didn't know what to do with it, how to classify it, because this was in the realm of charismatic and that was bad. <laughs> so, drugs. Yeah, so she says, well, if you don't want to be a farmer or be a plumber or an electrician, that's where the money is. And I'm actually standing there kind of dumbfounded. Um, did you hear what I just said? Kind of thing. And so it was one of those moments where there was this cultural push. Uh, and I think a big part of it can be in farming, working class, but there can be, it doesn't have to be, this can be a white, white collar attitude of you make your own way. And I don't disrespect that. I'm not in here to make people wimps and <laughs> make you feel bad about yourself and uh, you know, make you feel like you have to have counseling. It's a sense of, it's there if the Lord leads you, I just want to be available for you and I don't want to waste your time when you're in my office. So I want to pull my sleeves up with that old working class attitude, the same thing, let's just, let's just understand this and work through it. Um, so I respect that attitude. I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily that is there, but it can really come out people really are called to come and sit down and work something through, uh, those attitudes can come out and really push against something that the Lord has for the person that it might be the only place that they can unfold. And that's what we, I say, I'm a team player. Um, and there's different forms. If I'm listening to a person and, uh, like, okay, so in my sessions, I've, I've got this guy that's an atheist, but he only finds comfort. Um, <laughs> He thinks about the afterlife and it scares him, but he's a dedicated atheist. So he said, I just can only find comfort when I think about the Christian solution to this. And I said, so maybe you need to explore that. <laughs> but I knew I wasn't the person. So Pastor Manny came to mind. And so he's been reaching out to him. And so it's just that sense of making sure that you don't have to be the one and only for everything, but to be available. Um, so I don't, 
I don't get defensive about bad attitudes about counseling. I don't like it when people will, if I'm the guy in the group, uh, <laughs> they talk about me as the counselor, and they'll make counselor jokes way more than they will any other jokes about anybody else there. So it's obviously a something that disturbs people in that, and I'm really trying to be off the clock, but you know, it, it kind of comes out, that's what happens. But um, it's just, there's a cultural pushback that what I represent is weakness in people. And I'm trying to represent healing but not arrogantly. I'm just trying to say it ain't my idea, but I'm here, the Lord can use it. But it's just, it scares people, and then you have to look inside yourself if you're gonna sit down. And you know, most of the time when people have been so busy in their lives is that they don't wanna to listen to what their hearts are saying. And they're so pressed in on that, so that's what I represent, I think. So the older generation would just work hard. Um, the younger generation isn't as dedicated in their work ethic. So they want a video game more, they want to do this, but they keep running into themselves somewhere. Um, and it feels like there was a more healthy aspect to things maybe a half a generation ago, a generation ago for the whole thing. Society has gone so godless that people have nothing now. It used to be that there was at least an understanding of a Christian basis and stuff, so you had a sense that what you as a parent were saying, there would be general agreement with what the school teacher was saying, <laughs> and what people were saying across the board. Now it's really confusing, and people don't have a basis to stuff, and there's a lot of talk about mental health in negative, negative ways. I mean, all the talk about suicide, all the talk about depression, we have to have awareness, but these people, it's feeding things. And so there's this balance that I don't quite know the right answer to it, but I think there's a super high negative focus that's in that, what I was talking about before, the negative 100 to zero. Um, we're not getting our message out there of the zero to 100 mm -hmm. of this, and that we represent healing and we represent safety and security. And uh, that's what's missing in society. And so, before it would be this attitude of just work your way through it, we don't need this, we don't have time. Now there's really this desperateness, almost when I'm talking to people, there's a blank slate sometimes, um, that it doesn't even register that they're worth it. Um, when they're dedicated to their suicidal thinking, that's tough. Um, so it gets to be kind of the same thing, the response is almost the same to counseling, because <laughs> I'm a waste of their time. So it's a different deal. But, uh, so that's what I would say is that's the younger generation that's coming up, that there's much more openness from your dad and my generation coming down toward you know, the younger generations. Yes, there's been it's sequentially more openness to counseling, which has been good, um, but there's also more of a, well, I, people don't want traditional answers anymore because there's so much relativity out there, my truth is this. And um, so sometimes it rings very hollow for people. It's interesting, I, I wouldn't even have thought about that in the sense of my kids growing up, all this disarray, different types of um, authorities in, in the church or at home or at school, it's all just causing chaos in them and leaving them with, with nothing. Um, Wow, that was crazy. Um, so let's talk about what oh, you and I got to talk about a little bit on, on Tuesday and embarrass myself a little bit here. Um, I asked Dr. Dan, not Dr. Dan, I'm sorry. You can say Dr. Mr. Joke, whatever, yeah. yeah. As long as you go wink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dr. Dan. <laughs> cool. Uh, I asked Dan, I said, Dan, why is it that as humans, we tend to focus on the negative things that happen to us, embarrassing things, Something that's bad that was said to us or, or whatever. And I gave the example of when I was six years old playing t-ball. Um, I shared this with Will and Alyssa today. Uh, I was going to play t-ball and I just got this new pair of shorts and they were reversible. They were light blue on one side and dark blue on the other side. And at the time, I don't, I don't know what I was thinking. It was just, I got my t-ball shirt and I was like, oh, my shorts clash with this, with this shirt. So let me flip them. And so I flip them, I go, and I start playing t-ball, and I'm up to bat. Uh, and the umpire, the coach, the dad, who was just volunteering, was um, way too involved in his kids' sports, was saying, was like, hey, uh, your shorts are, are, are backwards. 
And I look back, and I'm like, it, they're reversible, it's okay. So I go and I'm playing and uh, play the whole game. Finally, I get, I get done with the game and I get home or I'm in the car and I realize, sure enough, uh, my shorts were backwards. The drawstring was on my butt and my, my pockets were going that way and everything, like, every, like super, super embarrassing moment. But what's fascinating is that I remember that those shorts were blue, navy blue and like a sky blue. And I remember that very well. I remember I was up to bat. I remember my shirt was gray. I remember all these different things about that specific moment. But I don't remember um, the type of car that my parents were driving. I don't remember my theme for my birthday party that year. All these different like great moments that happened that year. None of it. Just. I can't remember any of it. Maybe it's because I was six, but regardless, that's, that's a lot of, I don't want to say baggage, but uh, a lot of embarrassment to carry for 23, almost 24 years. Um, all because I thought I was so cool that my shorts were reversible. And so how many of you have one of those moments? As he was telling that, do you have a moment that came to your mind? It's not uncommon, and that kind of fits with what we're seeing here. And, and it may not even be embarrassing. Like I, I remember that some hurtful things that were said to me just randomly. <clears throat> Man, he's not dedicated. He's just relies on his talents and doesn't apply himself. You know that kind of stuff. So it's been my problem my whole life. I feel like I should be laying down right now. Actually, <laughs> now that I said that, wow, something about you just Whoa, just ends up. up. Yeah. Uh, anyway, but can you... <laughs> it's gonna leave. He's just gonna have a session. <laughs> can you elaborate on that? Because when we talked about it, you shared some really good uh, insight about that. So if I miss some of my really good insights, I will remember. It. I will. But, uh, I think a, a big part of the, the negative mindset that we seem to focus on <clears throat> is, uh, number one, we are born into a sinful uh, mindset. And there's just something odd that happened in the garden with Adam and Eve where they had everything going for them. And then when God provided everything, there was just one thing they couldn't do. And it's not like this was the only tree, this was the tree that had the only good fruit on it that tasted really good. Everything else tasted just as good. It's the one thing they were told you cannot do is eat from the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so they just schemed on that. And it wasn't just, when you read that whole passage, there's a lot to dissect there, that it wasn't just the, the sin happened in the moment that they ate of the fruit. There was some thought that was going into that, that was, I'm being held back from what I could have been. So there's this self-centeredness to us as human beings that comes from Adam and Eve and, and stuff. And I, I think when an embarrassment is pasted over on top of that, there's that, you keep rolling over, what can I learn from this? What could I have learned? What could I have done differently? I can't believe this, poor head slapping. I don't know if you guys are U2 fans, but the uh, Stuck in a Moment song is, when he was telling me that story at Dunn Brothers, it was that song, I told him that. That's just, that's that song, Stuck in a Moment, um, where you can't get over it. Um, but there's that point in our lives where I think we have those areas, and it takes some work it still will be an entertaining story, but there can be still some aspects to it that are actually, you gotta work through and let God's grace, you know, come over it. Don't wear reversible shorts anymore, that's for sure. <laughs> that's <laughs> one of the main lessons you learn. <laughs> At least that you know of, you know, unless you wear something that's true, yeah. Yeah, So, But um, I think to go, go over and above what uh, Pastor Manny and I talked about, is I think sometimes there's a self-protectiveness to continually being kind of uh, focused on the negative in life. Um, I notice this with people who are anxiety prone. Um, they're always thinking of the worst case scenario and anticipating based on their past experiences, how bad can this go? And usually the reason, one of the primary reasons they're doing it is to avoid embarrassment, um, avoid uh, being let down but their mind is so stuck in it that their energy is being sucked over to that. So it gets to be another uh, weird loop there. Um, but just sometimes there's been real bad situations where you've had a continual set of circumstances that have been blows. And 
That's one thing that I will come alongside people sitting in my office is they'll expect that I'm going to look at them and say, well, here's the right answers. Um, there's a lot of people that I will look at honestly and say, I got to tell you, you're kind of my hero because I don't think I would have done as well as you've done this far with what you've been through. Um, I don't, you're really strong. Sometimes they don't recognize how strong they are or how the Lord has really been showing up for them already. Um, so I think that's a part of it where I want them to recognize how the Lord's already been working with them, um, not make it like they haven't had anything good happen before they've talked to me in that. And honestly, there are many people that I'll be talking to that I'll be like, I can't, wow, you're, you've done actually incredibly well, or they've been told how bad they've been doing in life by people that just weren't nice people in that and uh, they've been set up for failure in many ways. So there's some of those people that are genuinely coming out of those tough situations that they're negative mindset. Um, you got people that I think are doing it for the self protectiveness like I'm saying anxiety and depression. But I think there's people that are just kind of greedy who <laughs> are saying I deserve more, um, whatever that more means and um, that person has more than I do but yet they don't realize in their own life how gifted and talented they are. If they'd focus in their own world, they could enhance those things. Kind of a little joke you made there about, you know, uh, applying yourself rather than just in, in relying on the talents, that sort of thing. It's that sense of that the, everybody's got gifts, everybody has specialness, everybody has uniqueness. But I think a lot of times so many people are focusing on what the other person has that they don't have, that it just feeds that. And I'm, there's a degree, a large degree of the Impressiveness that has increased in the last generation or so here that really is about that. I'm not getting what I expected I should have. So, um, and that's a huge part of it where just helping them work past. Just, there's self centeredness in all of these areas. Um, so, I mean, self centeredness, uh, you take pride, that's obvious. Like, that person is, is really always thinking about themselves and bragging about themselves. But if you're thinking about yourself in a negative way, that's the other side of the same coin. The low self-esteem is still self is the common mm -hmm. there. And it really um, more, we have that in the solutions in the second. You know, there's that stuff that where to get past yourself is a huge, um, you know, I'll do a lot of con confrontation on that type of person and they're really set up to not take confrontation because no, no, you're picking on me. <laughs> On you. I'm trying to get you to the good you, you know, and this doesn't fit. So I, I'm confronting that person, but I'm not, you know, it's just a sense of being open to what a different view of themselves. And I think when we were, we were talking, you explained how, um, just, just as you were saying, that we are the center of our universe, and we were kind of wired that way, you know, we um, just for whatever reason, we are the main character in our story and we should be able to control everything that happens to us. Every word we say, every action we do, anything that happens, we should be able to control and when that... Who told you that? You did. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were saying that that's how mentally we were, we were wired and, um, and how when things don't go the way that we expected or maybe something happens, we make a mistake, we instantly begin to feel shame. And how Adam um, in the garden, he began to feel, he began to feel shame immediately and hid from God. And how today when we feel shame, we begin to hide from the people around us. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, dealing with a, a struggle of pornography or an addiction to something else, whatever, different things um, will cause us to feel shameful. And all that shame does, I feel like it's just like food for isolation. And again, it's all a spiral. You keep going back to the same thing to fix the original sense of shame. Right. It creates more shame in that. Um, but yeah, um, well, those are really good words. <laughs> well, and then we we did all we also talked about how even in the church, and I think this is this is important for us to hear, is that as a church, we haven't really. Um, had these kinds of conversations, we haven't talked through what do we do, what do we say to people when they come to us with something that they're feeling ashamed of? We're really scared 
to let people be honestly genuine with what they're really, really struggling with. Because we're scared that accepting them in that moment means they're going to feel some level of endorsement. So we feel like we still have to hold that line of that this is still wrong. But it's creating a problem that, I mean, you got people that are raised in the good families, quote unquote, that are still going home. They're the ones that were raised in the church, second or third generation. They're not going to be honest with anybody in that church because it hasn't been created for that. They're continuing to make the image look that way. And that's the one thing that I, you know, with my kids, um, I told them all through the years, I'm not worried about in the end um, about anything else for you other than you, you hear the, the word of the voice of God and you obey. I want you to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and obey. I'm not worried about this or that for church or this or that for um, what leadership role. If God sets you in a leadership role, that's great. If, if that's where, you know, if you're going to be stepping into this. But that was always my goal for my kids. Um, I think it's there. I think they've gone in and out of seasons with it, and so they're learning as they go on, which is, I did. I mean, I got whacked on the driveway <laughs> and that. So, but there's just that point there where I do think as a church, um, knowing where people are at, knowing they haven't really set out to get into the sin, um, letting them tell their story in a way that, uh, with a safe person in the church, that um, is... They're not feeling judged for it, but um, it doesn't mean they're already talking to you so they know it's not okay. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, so we don't have to be worried about that aspect uh, in that. So there's that sense of just, not, and then not being scared of what they have to say. There's been so many times where I had a, a just a, uh, not flaming gay man, but uh, identified gay man who came in my office, and I've had a few of those clients. And I'm just sitting there with him in particular, and I'm like, Lord, what do, we, okay, what do you want me to do here? And he said, just love him. I'm like, okay, and don't mention his homosexuality. Okay, just focus on his anxiety. Because that's why he's here. And so we had a great counseling experience and at the end of it, he said, he never asked me about my homosexuality. And I said, well, it wasn't the issue. He said, huh, I thought you'd peg that right away, being a Christian counselor. And he spent a half an hour just talking about that realm. That's maybe we touched on it before. But it opened him up in a way by not making what we see as the main issue, which oftentimes as a church we're focused on sin. So that's a negative mindset when you think about it. Um, just like with... Uh, Secular psychology, just, they're just focused on diagnosis. That's a negative mindset. And so there's that sense that we're kind of born into it, especially in church where sin managers in that. Um, and so there's just that sense of letting the Holy Spirit give you some freedom to really love people in odd ways. But he didn't feel that I endorsed his world. Uh, he just wanted to, he wanted to tell me about it. And there were some odd things he told me about it that were like, why are you? <laughs> I'm not going to get into it here. But it's just, it was part of his story. And it's like, wow, okay, I'm listening. And that, I think, was more healing for that man that I had. Um, no, we don't. I don't have a conversion story at the end of this. I don't have the Billy Graham and he got down on his knees and he gave it. I don't even have that. But I know that I built something into this man's life by being a block layer or whatever you want to say. I put a building block. So I think as a church, we need to be just more open to being that type of healing. My business would go down on that because they'd have a, a place of a safe body with that. And I'd be willing, that'd be great um, on that. Um, because the church um, is the bride of Christ. Uh, <laughs> the counseling center isn't. So I'm part of that. I've been in an extended fashion and underneath the umbrella of the church. But there's just something that to make sure that the church is recognizing and being willing to what the Lord has to say uh, these days, uh, reaching out to people, don't be afraid. Yeah, well, I put it in the hands of a few, and you can put it in, in everybody. Um, that's really interesting. So when we talk about this negative mindset, how we're born in a negative mindset or in a sinful nature, um, you have some, some tips here or tricks or something like that to help us kind of 
uh, what's the word, counteract yeah. that mindset? First off, you know, you need to know your identity in Christ alone. That has to be your primary definition of who you are. And I think that grows in time. I, I think we continue to learn more what that means. Um, Clint, when you, it was Sunday ago when you guys sang the blessing. Um, I think I had the same attitude as you did about that song at first. It's like, yeah. and then, you know, uh, what's funny is I prayed that ironic blessing prayer. It's the first part of the song over my kids every night. Everyone, I pray it. Um, so that's part of it. The song is boring to me. But then they added that whole second part of it that's the expanded blessing that I hadn't really heard before. And I pulled it up on my phone, and I'm like, holy smokes, what a set of words. And I'm just bawling there in church, you know, that whole sense of, you know, what it means to be in Christ and the promises that are there to step into and what's there for you and for the generations to come. There's a sense that I'm learning more and more all the time. Part of it is my age, part of it, I cry at the drop of a hat nowadays on things. Because, you know, it has to do with family, I'm bawling. They just all laugh at me, oh, Dad, we got to bawling again, that kind of thing. <laughs> it's because you guys did something good. Oh, crap. That's Liz. Liz is a crack like that. And it's rubbing off on me, for sure. <laughs> so, for sure. You know, letting the Lord, letting Christ continually define you. Um, and there will be different ways, no matter where you're at, any situation. That song that was, uh, you're showing up here in the moment, um, that we sang earlier. Um, knowing that if you're anxious and stressed, there's not one situation or one room you're going to step into that Christ isn't in there already. And he's got the answer for you. Stop overworking what the answer is supposed to be. Stop trying to figure out the logic of the situation. The Lord will meet you in that moment. And he's got what you need. And it's going to change who you are by stepping into what he has for you in that moment. And I think that's a big part of it is we're scared to become something new. You know, and, but be willing to do that. And then once you take that step, find like-minded people that are matching that for you. Because if you are a negative mindset of person, then you're going to be surrounded most likely by other negative mindset of people. And so you have to find other people that are embracing what your goal is, what your plus 100 is. Um, and they, those negative people will naturally shed away from your life for various reasons. I've seen that with alcoholic situations, people that are pursuing sober life and um, they start pursuing that, but people actually reject them. They don't have to reject the people. It just happens because they're in that. Uh, a few other things. Um, again, allow the truth to be spoken to your heart and attitudes. Let other people who are um, good for you speak speak deep to your heart. Don't be defensive. That's a big difference when you see people stepping and getting healthier. They want to hear things about them. They don't. Well, that's my. This is my truth. That's your truth. Just stop talking to me. Hurt my feelings. It's more like, okay, bring it on. Let me see it. I want to bring it down. Um, Make proactive change as a regular part of your life. What are you changing? What What is different now than it was a year ago? Um, you talked about your dieting. You talked about stuff that's there. It doesn't have to be spiritual. It's just more, what are you doing that's there? That you explained it to me. I hadn't heard it before. You know, kind of thing. It's cool on that because you're understanding some stuff. You're working, you're working with your body. Exercise is important, especially if you're an anxious person. Well, both anxious and depression, but the anxiety more of a runner and walker, that's the stuff that's being, le the um, hormones and the chemistry that's being released into your body is exactly what's mean, you know, helping you to run away from a situation. So if you stay stuck in a situation, you're actually, you're breaking your body, the muscles down unhealthily. So you gotta exercise that stuff out of your system and that's important. Deep breathing is good, but make sure you've got a regular time with the Lord in all of this, so as you get an understanding of what your identity is in Him and like-minded people, and you have an openness to the Lord of what He wants for you, make sure you're spending uh, regular time with Him. One of my clients described uh, his prayer time with the Lord as he makes the phone call and leaves a voicemail, and then he opens the Bible up, and that's the text back that the Lord sends him. Um, that was pretty cool. Um, I asked him permission to use that, and I got to pay him ten cents. <laughs> <laughs> little tease on everyone else that uses it, yeah. If you use that, let Dan know so he can... Because <laughs> i got to pay the guy. <laughs> but it's just that sense of just recognizing the... I don't have the Bible here, but, uh, you know, I've got it on my phone. 
and the privilege and the pleasure of this, this book that is God-breathed. I don't care what argument you want, well, what's percentage of it, what is this exactly or not. I'm just saying this is it. There's no other Bible. So take your time to let God speak to you through that. Take time to be around people. Um, yes, step into the Holy Spirit. Step into the gifts. Step into what he has for you. But let yourself be changed into his likeness. And that's not just an idea. <laughs> you know, it's a shift. And let that happen. Sense. Yeah, not to me, but to them. <laughs> um, well, I think we're gonna drop it there. If you have anything else that you want to say after what I say, then go for it. You're smarter than I am. But um, one of the things I want to challenge you guys with is understanding what he is saying here. Is is it's a lot about listening to the truth, surrounding yourself with people who are going to speak truth. Uh, reading the word of God that is obviously the truth and, and all that stuff and not believing the lies that are told about you or said about you or that you begin to say um, about yourself because those things, as soon as you begin to listen to the world or even listen to yourself, you, begin, you will begin to feel shame. Shame and shame and shame. You just begin to isolate yourself and you begin to close yourself off to not just other people but God or even the opportunity to, to, to seek counseling or anything like that. And so when we are constantly reading and hearing truth, we will begin to evolve into the person that God has created us to be, going from the negative 100 to 100, um, which is ultimately where we want to be um, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all that stuff. Um, so just remember to surround yourself with truth and people who will speak truth um, in your life at all times. And um, I just want you just just click something there that that negative whatever's going on in your head that definition talking about it's coming from a different source. It's it's not God's definition of the situation. Um, and the best you can do in fighting that is getting to zero, just hurting less. But that sense of what you're talking about surrounding is it's God's defining of you as the plus one hundred, and let that be different goal for you uh, to just let and you you have to be changed to match that that's where people are scared to step into that that's why so i play it safer be in the negative mindset just kept keep going back to zero because they're playing by their own rules um but they're not getting anything so it's just that sense of letting god change what your idea of you is and that's not just an idea that's not some hyper charismatic thing that's just real um that uh, that's when you Awesome. Well, hey, if you guys um, have any questions, feel free to um, message us. Maybe connect with Dan right before he leaves or whatever. Uh, but if you have questions you want us to answer, message us. All I would love to get together with Dan again and talk and answer some of these questions and then um, either make a post about them, a blog, whatever. Um, I think that this is an important enough topic, a deep enough topic that I'm sure many of you guys are leaving today with questions or thoughts or maybe some challenges. I do have my cards out there at one of the tables by the front. Got the book there. It's $10 a piece. So uh, I'll be hanging out there and you can chat with me briefly too. If you want. Do it. He's a good guy. I'll vouch for him. Not just because he's up here, but. I can tell us. My daughter Abby had a huge crush on me. She's back in uh, <laughs> junior high. And uh, so I do that. And I, I can take credit for this. Manny was really shy about his guitar playing. He had backed away, and I talked to him off the side. I said, Manny, I've heard you play. You gotta get up front. You gotta get in there. And I don't know if you remember this, but I remember All the time. I spoke into you. I, I said, thought about you that. Gotta get in there. And so like even last Sunday when you were up front playing, we kind of like, I take a little pride in that last time <laughs> I played. Because uh, that was there. So Abby did not know that I had just kind of quietly not discipled you really, but just encouraged you and stuff. It was just something where I knew that you were a guy that didn't have that confidence exactly and something was off there. So I just wanted to make sure that, you know, you're good. You're really good at what you do. And 
that shit, just let it go. So she saw that we were friends, and our, I met, I said, there's something on Facebook. She said, why are you being friends with my friends on Facebook? And I said, because, oh man, you know, I know each other separate from you. No, we were friends way before. <laughs> this is one of those funny things where it's a generational deal where you were, you know, yeah. not, not halfway between us, but, you know, kind of whatever. So I just had to share that. So. Well, so then to, uh oh, uh, uh, Clint, you owe him. Because if I, I wouldn't be playing if it wasn't for Dan. Yeah, you know, it was right right before that. Yeah, it's true. I do remember that. And I was driving here, and uh, I even thought about that. I said, Dan was a guy who, early on, speaking life and just pouring into me and uh, make, being fun about it, and not just like being serious and like you need to get your crap together and, and worship God and whatever. But you're just saying like, let it rip. You know, you wail on that guitar, whatever. Uh, and there's these little things that you spoke into me. Those little truths. You know, or I was, I believed that I was just not good or I shouldn't have been up there for whatever reason. Um, so, yeah, perfect so example. Watching you step into the pastorate and just that stuff, you're just on the so that's cool. So, thank you. Good guy, too. So. <laughs> and Adam Westby's a good guy, too. So, we just got a bunch of good dudes here. So, I'm going to pray and then I will uh, dismiss you guys. So, Father God, we come to you. Uh, we're just so grateful for the opportunity to. Uh, Listen and hear some wisdom from Dan, Lord. I thank you for the many gifts that you have given him, including being an, an exceptional guitar player, Father God. And that, that day that you called him, you spoke to him so clearly um, about what he was to do. God, it was for moments like this, moments where he could pour into generations, pour into people who need to hear you uh, and learn more about how much you love them and how you designed them to live um, for you. So we thank you, God, for this evening, and we just ask that you, you bless Dan and his family and, and how it's growing and all that amazing stuff, Father God, and that as he steps into this role of grandpa, that he uh, man, just fill his pockets with, with delicious candy and a loving heart and um, a lap always ready to have a grandkid in there, Lord. So we love you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You guys are free to go. Like I said, if you have questions, come see us or come see Dan. We would love to, to continue to grow in this department. Have a good night.